Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, homework, uh, the next homework is posted. That's due November 1st. Take a look at that. That is on Canvas. And we will start Lab 7 this week, which involves sensor integration and some automation of your project. So I'll see you there on Friday. So during the previous, cl previous class, we talked about microcontroller port pin configuration. We talked about level shifting. And we talked about analog to digital converters and how those work and how the microcontroller implements them. So today we're going to talk about microcontroller timer peripherals and we'll talk about interrupts and we might be able to finish up microcontrollers today so we can move on to electronic sensors during the next class. So let's let's jump right into that. Okay, so microcontroller timer peripherals. When you think of a timer, it's something that, well, um, times between events uh, on sort of a, you know, a, a one second or a minute scale. When we talk about microcontroller timer peripherals, we're talking about a microsecond or sub microsecond resolution typically. So the purpose of these timers is usually to measure time between input events um, or to produce accurate delays for output events, right? So if you want to um, uh, time between two digital pulses coming into ports, you can do that with timers and you can implement um, delays for let's say uh, pulse generation or waveforms like pulse width modulators. Right? You can also implement real-time clocks, which is more of what, what we're used to when we think about timers. Real-time clocks have usually one second resolution. And so that would be more on a human time scale. You can also use timers to count events, either regular events or events that happen at irregular times. And you can use timers to implement watchdog functions over the microcontroller. So it, it can happen. Microcontroller software can have bugs in it and you can have upsets in hardware such that the microcontroller stops working. Well, a, a watchdog function actually um, monitors the, the, the microcontroller's operation. And if the microcontroller software doesn't, um, doesn't call a certain function or what they call pet the dog every once in a while, then the watchdog assumes that the microcontroller has stopped functioning properly and issues a reset. So all of these different uh, functions can happen as a result of microcontroller timer peripherals. Timers are based on counters that are integer values. And these integer values increment at a constant rate, typically, um, and a very precise interval, usually controlled by a crystal oscillator or derived from a, a crystal oscillator. So they might have one microsecond or sub microsecond, or maybe you know a few microsecond resolution typically. And these counters, these integer counters, these timers usually run asynchronously and independently of the main program. So while your program is off doing something, right? These, this timer is running in the background. And if your program gets bogged down with some kind of function communicating or calculating something, the, the timer doesn't get bogged down. It still counts at a regular interval. So it's, it's running independently and asynchronously with your main function. There's some terminology that you'll see show up for timer peripherals in microcontrollers. And that's output compare and input capture. So when you see output compare, that's usually used to trigger an output, make something happen based on a timestamp uh, that is compared to the current counter value, right? the current time. And you can use that to create pulse width modulation signals or precisely timed pulses or, or, or generate other kinds of, of waveforms. So that's output compare. You're comparing. Um, a, a desired timestamp that you've programmed in to the actual time to do something. Input capture is when you actually capture the time or record the time, record the, 
the counter value or the timer value. And um, what you're usually doing is recording the time of an event. Right? You can use that to measure frequency of a, of a waveform, or you can measure pulse widths, or you can measure time between events, right? time between pulses, um, or even duty cycles of waveforms. So the block diagram behind a timer, this is a kind of a generalized block diagram. Every chip and even different peripherals, different timer peripherals within a chip have different block diagrams, but this diagram represents most of what you'll, you'll see. So on the left here, we have a time base. So the time base is, is a clock signal. It's usually a square wave, and it has usually a very precise frequency. Um, often that's generated from a, a, a crystal reference, right? a high precision time base. Um, that can be the main processor clock. So you have a, um, a crystal on your Arduino board that generates a clock that synchronizes the operations of the, the microcontroller's processor. Um, or you can have another clock. You could have a clock that is a separate crystal or even an external clock supplied to the timer peripheral. Um, or you can have an external input. You could have some kind of event from a sensor coming into the, the timer peripheral. And that could be regularly timed. It could be irregularly timed. might happen only occasionally, but that can also be an input. And then you have a, uh, uh, a multiplexer. MUX is multiplexer. A multiplexer basically routes a signal. So the multiplexer is selecting one of these three inputs, the main processor clock, the other clock, or another port input. And it, it connects it to what's called a prescaler, typically. And the prescaler reduces the frequency of an input square wave. It's basically another counter. Um, and microcontrollers often have a prescaler that reduces the frequency by a factor of two to the n, where n is an integer value. So you can, you can decrease by, well, nothing, I'll say one, or a factor of two, or a factor of four, a factor of 16, factor of 256. So usually you can set that prescaler n value to take a 16 megahertz processor clock signal and drop it down to one megahertz with a divide by 16 setting in the prescaler. Okay, so now you've taken that clock and possibly divided it down in frequency. And then you have a signal, a clock that goes into an integer counter. So that integer counter um, will increment or sometimes decrement uh, an integer value with, with each edge of this input, input source, which is the output of the prescaler, right? So the counter is counting along with edges of that clock. And then this is all controlled in, in the peripheral with this timer control. So that timer control lets you uh, compare values of the counter to whatever value you program in. It lets you uh, set values of the counter, um, and it lets you get values from the counter. All right, so you can, you can capture the values. You can write values to registers that control the counter peripheral or the timer peripheral, such as the prescaler value or the MUX selection setting. And you can do that using the, the timer peripheral. You can also trigger output events, like make a pin go digital high or make a pin go digital low based on a timer value. And you can also get inputs from the, the digital pins uh, to, to, to trigger something, to make the counter um, do something. All right, and then there's this interface here uh, to the outside world or other places inside the microcontroller. So you have uh, registers that store values. Um, they communicate values to your program or to the outside world. You can connect to digital ports with a timer to have that digital port do something like go logic high on a timer value. Um, you can also trigger uh, interrupts. And we'll talk about interrupts. Those are special, hap special actions that can be triggered by timer values. Okay, so if you have a microcontroller application that requires precise timing, either measuring an input signal or timing an output signal, you're, you're probably using a timer peripheral in that microcontroller. So that's basically what they do. Okay. In the chat, how does a, 
prescalar deal with aliasing or do you choose the n factor that doesn't cause aliasing so aliasing let's see if i understand that that aliasing to me is when you're for example sampling um an analog signal um at less than twice the bandwidth of that analog signal if you're talking about driving the adc off of the output of the prescaler then that that could be an issue right you have to analog to digital converters operate off of um, clocks that also have prescalers. And if you set the prescaler to too high of a value, or in other words, too low of an, a sampling frequency, then then yeah, that that would cause aliasing of the sampled signal. Okay. And if that wasn't your question, shoot out a... No, that's good. Thank you. Okay. That was sure. it. Okay. Yeah. And so you'll see if you dig into the documentation, the data sheet, the 500 page data sheet, which is actually pretty well written, go to the section on A to D converters and you'll see you can set, you can set prescalar values to, to change uh, sample rates with a prescalar. In your, per, in your like experience, do you like find like a Nyquist frequency and then you just make sure that your prescale, your sample size is like beyond that Nyquist frequency? Yeah, for example, if I were sampling voice, if I were trying to get a, a sample of voice with an analog to digital converter, you know, audio can range from, you know, tens of hertz, low frequency up to some people claim 20 kilohertz, right? 15, 20 kilohertz at the very high end. Mm -hmm. If you're sampling voice, you know, I'd say, oh, you can capture that in three kilohertz. So you'd filter the audio signal to only capture the voice, like zero hertz to three kilohertz. And then I would sample at something higher than six kilohertz. I okay. would, set, I would okay. set the ADC to do that. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, you, you have to know, you have to know what you're sampling in order to not alias. And if right. you don't know what you're sampling, then you filter it and, and constrain the bandwidth so that you know you're not aliasing. Okay. But it's, yeah, it's not a black box. So, you know. Yeah. Somewhat. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. But when you see the word prescaler, that usually means divide the frequency down. When you see multiplexer, it means select one of many and provide an output. So here's a timer uh, example. Let's, let's generate a PWM waveform, right? L just like you're doing in lab. In fact, this is happening inside the microcontroller in your lab project. This is how it works. So microcontrollers, they, they use the timer peripheral um, to create different types of square waves. Right? When, when the microcontroller is talking about a waveform output, it's usually a square wave, uh, unless it has a, a specialized digital to analog converter built in, but we don't have that. So, and you generate those square waveforms at the digital ports. And you can control frequency, you can control phase, you can control duty cycle using parameters that you set in the timer peripherals. So pulse width modulated signals are generated using um, frequency control and duty cycle control uh, values within the timer peripheral. So for example, let's, let's plot out, uh, here is time along the horizontal axis and time in clock ticks, right? It's an integer value that's incrementing, starts at zero, starts counting, when it gets to the largest value that, you know, maybe a 16-bit counter can hold, it wraps around to zero again. So here's the counter value. Um, uh, so, there's, so, so there's time. Um, this is clock tick. So I should say this is clock ticks. Um, clock ticks don't have to be limited to a, um, a, a maximum value since it's just running. Here's the counter value, and it has some maximum value that the the, the um, digital word can hold that represents that integer value. So starting at zero, right, over time, the counter value just increases linearly, just increments one at a time. You can define, and, and I'm using the terminology from the, the at mega chip that, that you're using in lab, you can define a value called top. And when the counter counts up to top, um, it's going to clear to zero. It's going to get cleared to zero. And so it falls back to zero. And 
the clock ticks keep running, the counter keeps incrementing. And so it keeps going up again. And then when the counter hits the top value, it gets reset back to zero. Okay, and this keeps happening. So you can control that, that top value, right? There's, a, there's another value called CMP or, or compare. And that's another programmable value. And it's programmable to control a port value. So let's look at a port value. So here's a pick a pin. Uh, on your Arduino, it's going to be one of the one of the pins with the tilde next to it on the connector. So that's a digital port. And that can be controlled by the timer. So every time the counter falls to zero or is equal to zero, that port value is going to be set to one. So let's start on the left here. Start at time zero. The counter is zero. So we're going to set the port value. The microcontroller is going to set the port value to one. So that timer keeps incrementing, right? Keeps keeps climbing in, in its integer value. And the port value stays high. Um, and then every time the counter equals this compare value, that port is going to be cleared to zero. Okay, so the timer goes up, hits the compare value, the port value goes to zero. I should say the microcontroller causes that to happen, makes the port value zero. The counter keeps climbing in value, and then it hits the, the top value right? that you program. And so when the counter hits the top value, the counter falls back to zero. The microcontroller causes that value to go back to zero. And if the counter is equal to zero, the port value goes back to one. So you can see how this works in a periodic fashion. So the timer hits comp, port goes to zero, timer hits top, uh, counter goes to zero, port goes to one. Right? So this is, this is how you generate a square wave with a, a defined duty cycle. So this is a pulse width modulated voltage on that on that port pin. So think about that block diagram that I showed you, right? There's a there's a timer contro timer controller that is letting you set these top value, this top value, this comp value, and it's it's controlling depending upon the mode it's set into. Um, it's connected to a pin that is that is making this port value happen based on the timer value and top and comp. Okay. So the, uh, the comp value sets the duty cycle and the top value sets the frequency. So you can see the relationship here. You're, you have a, uh, this, this clock tick input that's happening to the counter. That frequency is controlled by the prescaler, which is dividing down that crystal oscillator value. So you can control the frequency there. And then you can finally control the frequency, right? Having a, a constant, um, clock tick here, you can finally control the frequency using the top value, and then you can control the duty cycle using this compare value. Right. And then if you want to lower the duty cycle, you change the compare value. So let's lower the compare value down to much lower than, than top. And, and then this happens. So you get the timer reaching that comp value faster in, in a shorter time. And so you get a lower duty cycle. So that's how pulse width modulation is actually being generated in, in the microcontroller you're using in lab. And then, of course, you can apply external filtering to this port voltage at the output um, to, to generate analog waveforms. Right? And you can actually generate time varying um, duty cycles with a, with a low pass filter where, where you're your frequency of your PWM digital signal is a lot higher than the filter bandwidth, and you can generate time varying analog waveforms too. So, so that's how PWM works. Is there a standard way in which the counter value increases, like a standard rate at which it increases? Or is that no, set by the hard hardware yeah. and the clock and all that? Yeah, it's set, it's set by 
So it's set by the processor clock rate. So typically, so if you have a 16 megahertz oscillator controlling your, your microcontroller, then, then it's 16 megahertz divided by the prescaler. That's what's going into the timer. Or, or you can actually apply, you can use a different crystal. For example, there are m many microcontrollers have the option for a, th a 32 kilohertz, 32768 hertz crystal. The reason that's chose, chosen is if you if you divide 32768 by 32768, which is a two to the n value, then you get a one second pulse. Okay, so so there's no standard value, and if there's some value you can't derive from the onboard clocks, then you can take that multiplexer, select another digital port as an input, and provide your own clock. Okay, yep. cool. So lots of lots of powerful things you can do with timers. That's a that's an output example, right? Generating a waveform. Let's talk about measuring an input waveform. So let's measure frequency. So microcontrollers use timer peripherals to capture times of events. Okay, so that means so an event. What is an event? It's a rising edge or a falling edge of some digital input signal. And so with that event timing, right, that, that time is actually just a counter value. You know, microseconds since the, either since the microcontroller turned on or since the timer rolled around to zero, either due to top or filling up its, its you know, maximum value. So these event times provide a way to calculate frequency, to calculate pulse widths even to calculate relative phases between square waves if you if you need to do that or you can count time between individual pulses okay so you can do things like um so if you took my last if you took my my um 3000 level class you built an infrared remote control detector tester where you were you were seeing the output pulses of of a, uh, of the infrared out of a uh, an infrared remote control. You were detecting it with a NIR detector, looking at the pulses on an oscilloscope. Well, you can use a microcontroller to actually time those pulses and figure out what, you know, what sequence of pulses and what timing turns on the TV, right? Or changes a channel. So you could build your own you could, uh, um, universal remote control by capturing capturing those signals, capturing the timing, and then regenerating that timing at a digital port. Um, you can build chronographs to measure uh, uh, events, time between events, and you could also time rapidly changing sensor outputs. So um, let's measure the frequency of a periodic square wave. Let's say that square wave is applied to a digital port. Um, and we're going to calculate the frequency by measuring time between rising edges of the input waveform. So here's the digital port. That's an input. So you're applying a square wave to a pin on the microcontroller. Let's look at the corresponding counter value. Okay. So when you want to use a timer peripheral to generate pulse width modulation or to prefer, uh, perform timing functions like build a build a chronograph you usually configure that timer peripheral to, to do that function. Right? And then you have certain settings you can set um, in, in the control parameters to do this. So I've set this, assume I've set this timer up to be a, a frequency counter or to measure time. Okay, so here's counter value versus time. Here's one pulse that comes in and let's set up this timer peripheral so that a rising edge on the port resets the counter to zero. So it starts at zero here. Then the counter starts counting over time. Right? And here's the digital port input and you get another rising edge. So that rising edge is going to cause two things to happen. The counter is going to be reset to zero, but we're also going to have a memory location or a register capture that count value 
on that rising edge. Okay, so then the counter resets to zero, keeps counting. The pulse goes down to zero and you get another rising edge. So again, the counter value is captured and the counter resets to zero and this keeps happening. Okay, let's just assume a periodic square wave here. So with, with each rising edge, we've captured the counter value. And what you can do is you can, on each rising edge, we'll talk about interrupts. You can, you can fire an interrupt and trigger an interrupt and get that value and put it in memory someplace else and then keep this whole process running. And so that captured count value um, provides the period in units of ticks, clock ticks, right? So if it's a prescaler of one and a 16 megahertz signal, then one over 16 million is the duration of the clock tick, is the period of the clock tick. And then you can convert the waveform period in ticks to period in seconds uh, using that counter clock period and then convert the waveform period to frequency, right? One over the period is the frequency. So, so that's how um, frequency counting works. And then you can average many periods or many timer values uh, if you're trying to get an accurate frequency out of a noisier waveform. All right, so that's an, that's an example of taking an input and using a timer to determine the time between events. All right, any questions on that concept? So I have shown you these values like count, like compare, like top. And th those are actually, I used the, the nomenclature out of the data sheet for the microcontroller you're using. You can use that in the Arduino language, but there is a simpler way to perform like 80% of what you would want to do with timers using the language. There's some some warnings there, but I'll talk about those. So there are um, provisions in the Arduino language to simplify timer use with these functions, right? Timing functions, analog I/O that's pulse width modulation, and some some more advanced I/O functions. So you 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 might have seen delay if you've used an Arduino in a basic class and you've blinked an LED you probably use the delay function and that pauses the program for um, an amount of time in milliseconds specified by the, the input argument. You can delay microseconds. Right? You can read the value. You can read the present value of a, um, a, a microsecond counter. Okay, that's what micros does. So if you if you if you're running a program and you're looping and you read the microsecond counter and then you let another loop happen and you read the microsecond counter again, you can calculate the time difference in microseconds. Um, this this number actually overflows every uh, seventy minutes. And then you can also read a millisecond timer. Right, that's the time. That's the number of milliseconds passed since the Arduino board began running. That rolls over every 50 days. You can use analog write to create a PWM signal. So that analog write is hiding all of that functionality that I showed you two slides ago, right? That, that all that's happening in the processor, all those configurations are being set by this analog write function. And, and it's sort of, it's, it's hiding that in the background. Tone generates a 50% DD cycle square wave on a pin. No tone stops the square wave. Pulse in returns the length of a pulse applied to a pin in microseconds. And then there's another function that apparently works better for longer pulses. I haven't, I haven't used that function, so I'll take the manual's word for it on that. So while the Arduino language simplifies using the timers, all of the capabilities are not accessible. There, there are 
there are ways to generate pulse width modulation so that you can, if you're generating multiple signals, you can maintain the phase between signals, things like that, that you can't do through the Arduino standard language functions. Um, but the, the language timing functions, the native microcontroller uh, timer functionality, um, they are available through the language. There's a way to use the, the native microcontroller functions, but they can conflict. Like if you start, if you use analog write to set up a PWM signal, and then you start messing with the registers that control the PWM signal, right? You're gonna you're gonna get conflicts there. So if you experience erratic or inconsistent results when you're using um, the Arduino functions, then you might try using the native microcontroller timer functions instead of the, the Arduino language. All right. So I mentioned that timers can make something happen on a particular count. You can cause a pin to go high. You can cause a pin to go low. You can, you can start a function. Um, that is done through the use of interrupts. That's one way you can use microcontroller interrupts. So interrupts, the function of an interrupt is to stop the main program execution and then immediately run a special function upon some event. So that again, that event can be a timer expiring. It can be a, a pin going high, a pin going low, something like that. And, and so, so you can set this up, you can set interrupts to look inside the microcontroller at values or outside the microcontroller on digital ports. Okay, that special function that runs when an interrupt is fired or an interrupt is triggered is called an interrupt service routine. It's just, it's a function, it's a function in C. So that interrupt service routine is also called an ISR or an interrupt handler or just a handler function. And then once that ISR is, is done running, right, you, you've had a triggering event, the ISR runs, it's done, then the main program continues back where it left off. And so that ISR is somewhere in memory. It's, it's just, so, so all of your program code is in program memory and your functions that you write, just regular functions are in program memory and they have a starting address. Well, there's a special name for the address, the starting address of the interrupt service routine. It's called an interrupt vector. So if you see the term interrupt vector used, it's the starting address of, of an interrupt service routine, a function. So it looks something like this. Let's suppose you have a main program running. So here's time, time running. You have main program running, it's executing, and then you have some event occur. The main program stops running that the, there's a program counter that is pointing to where the current um, instruction is in the main program, that program counter gets changed and it immediately goes and runs the interrupt service routine and the interrupt service routine does something. Once it's done, then the main program picks up where it left off. And maybe you get another event, it, ISR runs. It's done, main program keeps running. And, Event, ISR, main program keeps running. So there's, so the ISR gets priority over the main program. In fact, you can have different levels of priority for different ISRs. All right, if you have two events, if you have an event happen during an ISR for some some other event, maybe right, you can you can define priorities of your interrupt service routines. But you don't have to. You can use it simply if you only have one interrupt event, then just take the default priority. So these interrupts are useful for storing times of events. So for example, the, the software you're using, the code you're using for your, your constant speed propeller project, every time the blade um, crosses the beam, an interrupt service routine is called. Okay, once, so I've attached an interrupt to the digital port that is sensing your infrared detector. 
And every time it senses a change, um, a rising edge or falling edge, I forget which, but every time it sets, senses a change, it goes out and it grabs a timer value and it stores it in memory. And then the main program keeps running. And so your program that you're running builds up a number of those timer values. And specifically, it stores the timer difference, the, the time since the last crossing. And so it builds up a number, number of those, I think about 12 of those. And then when you want, when your program wants to calculate the RPM, it goes and it grabs those 12 values, averages those 12 values, calcul calculates the RPM, and then that's that's how that's calculated. So the interrupts interrupts are used uh, in in your program in your project. You can also respond immediately to an external event if you have something you know a I don't know a sensor in a car, an airbag sensor, something fire. You can immediately go run another function to respond. You can um, execute functions at specified intervals using timers. So if you have, you know, if, if you're doing anything as simple as blinking an LED or every, you know, millisecond you want to do something or, you know, something like that, you, you can, you can, you can execute um, the ISR and you can even call other functions at specified intervals, intervals based on using a timer. You can capture external data upon arrival. So if you have a serial port or maybe you're doing some kind of custom data capture, you know, the first bit arrives, you're running maybe some program that's running a display and oh, you got to you have a bit arrive at a port, the port value goes high. So you might stop the regular program and then go pay attention to the port and capture all of those bit values and then and then come back to your main program. Okay, so typically ISRs um, are really short functions. You don't want to take a lot of time in this interrupting function. So you want to minimize the time that it takes an ISR to ex execute by not putting too much in that I ISR, like not doing complex computations. Um, and if you need to do complex computations, do them later. Do them in the main program when you have some more time. And you can pass values to the main program, Store basically store values in memory that's shared with the main program um, for computations. And generally, you try to avoid calling other functions that take a lot of time or are blocking functions. Like a blocking function is one that's waiting for your input. You don't want to do that inside of inside of an ISR. Um, if, if you want to trigger like maybe user input, what you can do is make, make a variable go from false to true that's shared with the main program, right? Make, make a variable go, okay, an event happened. Make that variable true. And then in the main program somewhere, you look at that variable every once in a while and say, oh, look, an interrupt happened. So go do something that takes a long time. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk about writing software on the Arduino for interrupts. So uh, of course, Arduino, it's a simple language and they've simplified things. So you have simple functions to use um, for interrupts. So here's an example. Let's trigger an interrupt on each rising edge of a digital pin. Right, so we want to look at pin two of the Arduino board you're using, trigger an interrupt. And then we want to change the state of an LED, the onboard built-in LED. We want to change that state uh, um, based on each interrupt. So here's what that program might look like. You can see setup, you can see loop. Walking through this, I've, I've defined the interrupt pin. Right? That's pin two. That's where I want my input that will trigger the interrupt. And then I declare... Um, a variable that's going to correspond to the LED state, either low or high. I mentioned on the past couple slides, you can you can share um, you can share variables, share global variables between functions. So if your interrupt service routine might change something, and your main function can then respond to that. If if something can change a variable. Unexpectedly, that's what this volatile keyword is for. 
It says, hey, compiler, don't expect that you control the variable. That variable might change by something else, like an interrupt or, or some external um, influence here. OK, so we initialize the LED state. We set the pin mode to an output for the LED. We make the interrupt pin a, a digital input. And then we tell, we tell the microcontroller what function, right, the interrupt vector, what function we want to call when that interrupt is triggered. So in the Arduino language, you use this attach interrupt function. And then you follow the instructions for the language, but the Arduino has a special function that maps the actual pin you want to use, pin two in this case, to the, um, to the coding that the interrupt function wants to see. So that's why you're converting this digital pin to interrupt and give, just giving it the interrupt pin. And then specify the function name. So here, here's the interrupt service routine down here. I've prefixed it with ISR. You don't have to, but that just calls out that this is an interrupt service routine. This is the function that's going to run every time the interrupt is fired or that pin goes high on its rising edge. So funny thing about C code, the, the name of the function is actu actually a memory location. It's a location in program memory. So it's not just a function. It's not just the name of something you're going to go run later. It's actually, you can, you can look at the value of, of that function name, and it looks like a variable. It's just the, a place in memory. So that's what this is here. I'm, I'm giving the location in the memory. It's the function name. Giving that, that um, location in memory to the, the interrupt. And then I want to trigger on the rising edge. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is then loop. I'm going to loop forever. And this loop does nothing. If that pin doesn't change, then nothing happens. Right? The loop keeps running. It keeps writing the LED state to that digital port to control the LED. And it doesn't know that there's anything else going on. But as soon as the pin experiences a rising edge, the ISR is called. And this ISR, all it does is inverts the state. If the state was a 0, it changes it to 1. If the state was a 1, it changes it to 0, independent of the main code, independent of that loop. So the loop is sitting here running. The interrupt service routine gets called. The LED state changes. It doesn't care. It just just puts the current value of the LED state. It writes that to the, to the LED built-in pin. OK, so that's an example of using, using an interrupt to respond to an external event. OK, so our Arduino libraries include uh, timer interrupts for some boards. So when the timer reaches a particular value, you can call an ISR. And if you want to access more advanced interrupt features, uh, then you can control those microcontroller configuration registers directly. All right, so interrupts were always kind of mysterious to me at one time. So, you know, when I was in school, so I wanted to make them not mysterious. All right, any, any questions on this or comments? All right. So just a reminder, writing Arduino software, the Arduino language is very similar to C, C++, except for some reason they call programs sketches. Makes it seem a little more friendly, I guess. I mentioned this before that standard C typically starts with executing a main function, and Arduino does not have that. So if you're writing typical C, you would have a main function, not a set up and loop. And then set up executes once, a uh, loop runs repeatedly. And then you can you can make your own functions called from these functions or you can call library functions. But the typical workflow looks something like this. 
So you install the board or you've done this in lab, but if you have a new board that you're using, you install the board using the IDE, uh, you create a new sketch or a new program, you write your instructions in the setup and the loop functions, you compile the program, check it for errors, the compiler converts that program to a binary file, then you upload or download, depending upon what you call it, the, the machine code, uh, the binary values to the board's program memory. Okay, and then you use the serial monitor or serial plotter uh, to display the data. Okay, but inside these functions, you're going to be using variables. Right? So here's an example, top section of a loop function. So the variable names are all the way to the right, right before the semicolon, and on the left, those are different data types. So what's on the list, this char or car, that's a data type. This byte, that's a data type. Um, you know, unsigned long, that's a data type. Here's the mapping of data types to, well, what they really mean. So you have integer data types and floating point data types. And you know, so for example, this char or car stands for character. Um, is a, it stores a value between zero and two fifty five. It's eight bits. This byte data uh, data type, it's it's the same thing. It stores eight bits, zero to two fifty five. This unsigned char or car, it stores well eight bits, zero to two fifty five, unsigned. So you cannot represent negative numbers here. Boolean is actually just a one bit value in, in real life. I mean, it's it only takes one bit, but this um, microcontroller and compiler works on eight bit boundaries. So you actually take eight bits in order to represent a Boolean value. Uh, this is an unsigned integer. Unsigned integers are 16 bits. Okay, and they're synonymous with a word or a short or an int. Oh wait, no, that's not true. That's not true. These are these are signed. So unsigned int and word are both unsigned 16-bit values that range from 0 to 65, 535. Short and int are 16-bit values that can be signed, that are signed ranging from negative 32768 to 32767. If you need a bigger integer, then you can use long right, um, or unsigned long, and those are 32-bit values. And so, and then if you need floating point values, you can use um, floats or doubles, which are both 32 bits in this compiler, or this, this processor. Okay, so you can you can have very fine resolution, and I think this goes down to something times ten to the negative thirty eighth right, in small values, and then ten to the plus thirty eighth roughly for large values, positive and negative. So the the word size this all depends on the type of microcontroller and the compiler you're using. So you got to check the information for your specific microcontroller. These are the Arduino data types. And so when, when considering um, what data type you're, so, you know, why, can, why, use, why use these bytes when you can use 32-bit words? Well, consider that when you're choosing data types, consider the amount of RAM that you have. RAM is where your variables are stored and your microcontroller has 6,000 bytes of RAM. So if you wanted, for example, to store values from some sensor and you store 8-bit values and you want to store, I don't know, 2,000 of them in RAM, well, you could do that with bytes, but you could not store 2,000 values of long integers because you'd, you'd fill up the memory. So when you're dealing with microcontrollers, every bit counts especially when using arrays, All right?
And also consider that if you're truly doing integer computations and you need speed, the floating point math is much slower. So if you're multiplying or adding um, doubles or floats, it's going to slow down your program. So if you can use integers, you typically use integers. All right. All right. So we actually just have a little bit to go on microcontrollers, but I ran out of time. So we'll finish up microcontrollers next time and we will start on electronic sensors. So don't forget the homework is posted. So take a look at that. That is due next week. Uh, check the other due times and due dates on Canvas. They're all posted. I will start office hours in just a few seconds. So if you'd like to join, please join. If not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.